I'd like you to open to the Old Testament to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to read in a few moments out of 2 Samuel chapter 12. In the title of this morning's message, Even a King Has Consequences. Even a King Has Consequences. In our story, we're going to read in a few minutes, we're going to find out that some different things happened in David's life ever since he was a boy all the way through his teenage years, uh, young adult years. Uh, as he gotten older, things have changed in his life. Um, he started out, we know, as a, as, a great, as a great young man, a leader, a king. Uh, many people we know start out strong with God. Some don't finish very strong, but it's really important as Christians in how we finish this race. That's, right. That's the most important thing. Uh, it's important how we start our walk out with Christ, but more importantly, how we truly finish. But some of the character traits are either good or bad that can change a person. We're going to read the story about David in 2 Samuel uh, 12. And this is the same David. When we get to 2 Samuel 12, it's not the same David as it was when he was a teenager out in the field taking care of his dad's sheep. Wasn't the same David as the one facing Goliath. Something happened. Something triggered it. Something went wrong in his life. The younger David, I remember, was so filled with worship and writing so many beautiful songs and out there dancing before the Lord and really um, taking care of the sheep by killing the lion and the lamb, protecting his father's sheep. Um, he was such a good leader. and was filled with godly wisdom. But something happened in the middle of his kingship. And let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, and let's just read the first six verses together. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had, he had bought. He raised it and grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to a rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, Surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did one thing and had no pity on him. We see a different man here right there in the story with David. As a king, he became so powerful he became famous, he became a legend, a warrior, great reputation, a leader. He had anything that he ever could want in his life, but David stole another man's wife. Her name was Bathsheba, and her husband was Uriah the Hittite, a soldier who was called home by David, called him home because he wanted him to go home to sleep with his wife to cover up the sin that David had slept with Bathsheba. And Uriah the Hittite was such a loyal soldier. I mean, this guy's statement, and I'm just going to paraphrase it, but this guy's statement was amazing. Because what he said was, is that I'm not going to go, he told, he told the king this, is I'm not going to go home and be with my wife when all the other soldiers are out there fighting for you. And he slept outside by the palace and didn't even go home. This is the kind of man this was. This is the kind of soldier that this man was. This is his loyalty. But David had a turning point, a trigger, a temptation that allowed to overtake him. David at times probably thought he was bigger than a situation. David probably thought he was invincible and could make any decisions. You know, because I'm king and no one's going to find out about it. If they do, so what? What are they going to do about it? Because I am the authority in the land. And sometimes the enemy can plant thoughts in our lives as well, thinking that we can do things and we can try to get rid of things or we deserve things, we work hard, and the enemy will try to twist the truth and try to get us to think 
almost like the point David was when he was on the outside of his palace looking down at Bathsheba with his passion. He allowed his, the eyes of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life to get him at times. Many times, many times we think we can get away with disobedience, get away with sin, get away with doing something that brings pleasure to self and that it won't affect anyone else. That's one of the biggest lies of the enemy. When the temptation comes, one of the things that he famously says almost all the time, at least he does with me, is go ahead and do this. You deserve this. You work hard. No one's going to know about it. And then he takes it a step further. Besides, no one's going to know about it. It's not going to affect anyone else. Yep. Yep. Numbers 32, 23 says, But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. God speaks to Nathan the prophet. Nathan was an awesome prophet of God. And God speaks to him, and he says, Now I want you to go to speak to the king about his hidden sin, and could you imagine being in Nathan's sandals at that time? God, you want me to go and to speak to my king and talk to him about his hidden sin. You sure you want me to go? Well, I would probably if I were as Nathan's sandals, I'd be thinking the same way. I would be thinking about, well, what's my approach going to be like? How am I going to approach him? I mean, this is a big deal. Am I just going to walk there and say, hey, I got a word from God for you, Mr. King David. And the word from God is you either turn or you burn. God knows what you're doing. Now don't kill me. Well, that wasn't his approach. We know that. But his approach was, it was brilliant. His approach was a parable. It was a story. Because Jesus, we all know, taught in parables, taught in the stories, because it was easier for his disciples, it was easier for his audience to find themselves somewhere in that parable. Find themselves somewhere, find themselves where there's a lesson to be learned in that parable that, you know what, I understand that. I can understand that. I can't understand all these big terms or these big words that are up here. And, and there's nothing wrong with those, but someone better explain them to me. But what I can understand is I can understand what the rest of the people in the Bible, I can understand this parable. And when Nathan was telling him this parable, King David had no idea that he was right smack in the middle. Imagine him just heading towards the palace. Okay, I've got to use this parable. I've got to have a parable. I've got to have something to say to him. I've got to have something to say to him. So Ephesians 4.15 says this, and I believe this is also for us and how we relate to one another. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So one, when one Christian approaches another who is in sin, the person is living in sin will get offended, they'll get mad when you approach them, they'll get defensive, and the first thing they'll say is, Stop judging me. When the scripture says to go to them in love and gentleness, not to judge them, but to make sure you can see the fruit from their lives for the purpose of so that I can feel better or feel more mature spiritually, no. But to see my brother or sister who is on the wrong path, who's struggling, who gave in to temptation, to restore them back on the right path because you have their best interest in mind. Nathan had King David's best interest in mind, plus he was on an assignment. He was on an assignment from God to go and to do this. So we don't go to another believer with this spiritual eliteness attitude, or I don't, because we have to be careful that we can be uh, tempted ourselves and even to sin. We don't show up at their house with a thousand pounds of Bibles ready to smack them over the head with. Christians can observe other Christians' lives because of how, we, how they bear fruit or not. And so he shared this parable to the king so to understand what it was written. But the apostle Paul tells us this, 
when, when you see another brother or sister in Christ and they're struggling, pray for them. Yeah. Don't gossip about them. Yeah. Pray for them. Love on them. And then when you go to them, go to them as Paul tells us to go out of Galatians 6.1. He says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person with anger. No. Gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. So Nathan had this powerful parable to share with David, because in this parable, um, it was something that Nathan was probably hoping about in this parable. When I share this parable with the king, maybe he'll realize something may reignite in his life. Something may reignite. Something may take him back to the time he was out in the fields taking care of his father's sheep. Maybe in this parable there's something that's just going to click. It's just going to click, and he's going to understand very clearly what's happening in this parable. David knew that Nathan was a man of God and that God used him a lot. And the king decided to give Nathan a private audience. And so Nathan told him the parable. We read the parable. There were two men. One was rich, one was poor. They lived in the same they lived in the same city. They breathed the same air. They drank the same water. They enjoyed the same sun by the sun time, the sun at, during the day. They enjoyed the moon and the star at night. They worshiped the same God. But there was this huge difference between the rich man and this poor man. The rich man had so much cattle, sheep, cows, and camels, he didn't know what to do with them all. He had hired hands that would take care of all of his flocks. He didn't have to lift a finger. This rich man in the parable, he was famous. His name was admired. He was respected. He was popular. And King David didn't even know that Nathan was talking about him. In 2 Samuel 8.13, it says, And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Saul. So David is this legend. He's a better king than Saul. David, we know, killed Goliath to save Israel from the Philistines. But my king, there was another man in this parable. I have to emphasize something here about this other man in this parable, my king. And he's the poor man. And all he knows is, I'm not real sure where my next family meal is coming from. All I know is poverty. This poor man, my king, is not famous. He walks down the streets and maybe some people will just say hello to him. He just wants to try to get by every day the best he can for him and his family. So this rich man, my king, and the poor man, my king, are just worlds apart until one day their worlds did this, they collided. Their paths crossed. This is what happened next. See, a traveler, my king, came to the rich man's house. And he needed a place to stay. And of course, he was going to be hungry. The rich man wanted to impress his house guest, the traveler. So he offered him the shelter. He offered him a fantastic meal. So the rich man decides, instead of calling his hired man over and say, go to and gather I have thousands of sheep out there. Instead of just taking just one, just one, I have an abundance. I wouldn't even know it's missing. He doesn't do that. He goes to the poor man's home and takes his only possession was a baby lamb. That's all he owned. The rich man had that lamb taken to his place where he lived, had it killed, had it prepared for a meal. 
and fed the traveler. I don't know about you, but whenever I read the word lamb in our Bible, I immediately think of Jesus. Why? It's because it's there 98 times. In the Old Testament covenant law, we can learn a lot. In Exodus 12, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, taking into account the number of people that are there who are determined the amount of the lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. What's amazing to me, there is two covenant facts here of the Old Testament. When a colt was born, it says, take the firstborn colt and either you break its neck or you go to a lamb and you offer it from your household. When they would do it, they would have to offer the priest five shekels, and I don't know what five shekels is worth in our money today, but they had to pay the priest for this. And then I was thinking about the colt. Do you remember Palm Sunday? Before Jesus went into Jerusalem, he told his disciples, he told two of his disciples, go ahead of me, go to ahead of me to the next town, and you will find there a donkey and its colt right next to it, and they are tied up. And I thought about the word tied up. They were tied up because they were there because they were reserved for Jesus. They were there, they were born and reserved and standing there tied up to a wooden rail. They were reserved for Jesus to accomplish so he can get on its back and to ride into Jerusalem and to be worshipped as the Lamb of God. But I thought of the word tied up. And how many times in our lives are we tied up? Are we tied up with depression? Tied up with raging anger? Tied up with struggles in our lives, with relationships? We get tied up. And the disciples went there and they spoke to a man and said, the, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus has need for these. This man obviously knew that. He let them go and he untied them to be free. And I believe that the Lord, even before we leave today, there are things in your life and my life that the Lord wants to untie in our lives so that we can be free. And so they took them to the Lord and he chose to ride on the back of a donkey. Lord, why are you riding a donkey? Because a donkey symbolizes peace and humility. And besides, for poor people, horses and camels were only owned by people who had money. And besides, a donkey was, or a colt, was an unclean animal. But the lamb. And I don't know why, after all these years of ministries, I didn't see this until this week. Our Savior got on back of a colt or a donkey that is unclean. And who are we? But we were unclean. Unclean until the Lamb of God got on, side of, on top of the donkey. And it's through his blood that he made us from unclean to clean. And the Lamb of God took us from being unclean and to make us clean. He took us from being unrighteous to being righteous. And the Lamb wrote on the back of an unclean animal. In Zechariah chapter 9, it says, Rejoice greatly. This is prophetic. Daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see how your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. 
on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sitting on the back of a colt. The Lamb was headed to the cross to be sacrificed for our sins. Jesus went to the cross broken, so we didn't have to be. His sacrifice and his blood paid it all, the penalty for our sins. You see, and remember this next statement all week long, every man, every woman, every teenager, every child needs a lamb. We all need a lamb. As a young person, my grandparents were strong Christian people. They had the lamb. And I was riding along with them because they had the lamb. It wasn't until I was in college that I recognized I cannot live off of my grandparents' faith. I can't live off of my parents' faith any longer. I, as a young individual man, had to have my own lamb. The lamb had to be real for me. The lamb has to be real for you. Every household needs a lamb. Because without a lamb, they can be lost and they can be divided. Revelation 5, verses 9 through 12 says, You are worthy to take the scroll and open to its seals, for you were slain, speaking of Jesus, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people of nations, they have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, glory, and blessing. Now, as we go back to the parable, the rich man had so many flocks, and the poor man had one asset, one land. If I can't give my family a huge house, a lot of cash, several cars, several trips on vacation, what I can give them is the highest priority is I can give my spouse and my children the lamb. Amen. I can give them the lamb. They don't need stuff from me. They don't need tons of materialism from me. What they need from me, and I have to have it myself in order to give it away, what they need from me and every household needs is the lamb. Even John the Baptist. He baptized. Even the John the Baptist, as he was baptizing people, stopped. He paused because he saw something. He saw something with his own eyes that was incredible coming to him. And let me just pause and say this as a sideline. Every time that I have the honor of officiating a wedding, this is what I say to the groom. This is what I say to the groom every time. And I say this to him before his bride hits the back door. The last one I said it to was to your husband. And this is what I said to Dale and to every groom. I said, you wait to your bride opens those doors and comes down the aisle towards you. You'll never forget that the rest of your life. How beautiful that she is. I tell that to every girl. And after almost every ceremony, they come to me and say, Pastor, you're right. And this is what John the Baptist saw as he's baptizing people in the Jordan River. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And he says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, would you take a look who's coming? It is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For such a time as this, God is calling the men of his churches throughout this land, I believe, to rise up, to stand up, to get up, to get off of the couches and get into the game. 
It's time for the men, I believe, to die to self and to give their family and the people in this world. We need to give them the lamb. The lamb is the son of God who the world needs. We don't need more government. We don't need more politicians telling us how to live. We don't need more stuff. What we need is the lamb, and each person needs the lamb, and every household needs the lamb. They're saying, well, this is the problem of America. This is the problem of America. The problem of America is we have turned our back on our God. We need to repent because every single person needs the lamb. 2 Samuel 12, 3 says, But the poor man had nothing except one little lamb he had bought. He raised it and grew up with him and his children. He shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Could you imagine being at one of the tables during the time, even at the Passover? It was time for the tenth plague. Through Moses, he told Pharaoh, let God's people go, let my people go. Through nine plagues, he didn't bend until plague number ten. And God instructed Moses to tell his people to take a lamb and to kill that lamb and put the blood over the doorpost. But before that, what happened in the house? This is another thing that I didn't see. There's so much that we don't know, or I don't know, even in the scriptures today, that I'm still learning. I didn't see this. I didn't know this until you read some Hebrew history and figure out what really happened at that time. What are the scriptures really saying? When the dad brought this lamb home, he didn't have it in the house for a few days. He had it in his house for several days. Why? It's because before the lamb was killed, he wanted his spouse and his children to have a connection with the lamb. He's going to kill it someday, yes, and take the blood, but he wanted them to have a connection. God the Father wants us to have that connection with his son, the lamb. And then when the lamb was killed, it wasn't like, well, that's no big deal. If you're one of the kids, well, that's just no big deal. That lamb was just kind of an acquaintance. You know, we had no connection with the lamb. You know, go ahead and do it. We see the purpose for it. You know, we need to eat. And, you know, we need to do, put the blood over the doorpost. And the window. we need to do all this stuff. Yeah, we understand. There's no big deal. No. There was a connection. And here's a connection that I can put as a parallel to it. It just happened to Paul with his dog. It happened with, we had a, we had a Dawson dog up in Illinois that I had for 12 years. And we agreed to come to Florida to be caregivers. Debbie's parents said, no dog. I had to give my dog away. I was so close to that dog. How come we get so close to these animals? So close. And I gave him to a family that was a, a fireman and two beautiful kids. They really loved the dog. And he came in a pickup truck and took my dog away. And I was by myself. I went into my garage and I wept like a baby. We get so close. And I think the Hebrew fathers, coming from God our Father, down to the Hebrew fathers, wanted their families to get it, the connection with that lamb. If there's a connection, and the connection is broken, especially because the lamb died, was killed, then there's grieving, there's loss. And they, God wanted that to happen. To have that loss. But before the lamb was killed, could you imagine what the Bible says, what that guy did? The father? He took the lamb and he let a, the lamb sit at the di dinner, uh, diner's di uh, dining room table. Not that they had dining rooms. Probably one room places. But it ate with his kids. It ate with him and his wife. The lamb drank out of the same cup. 
cup. So here's the kids drinking, and all of a sudden now the lamb's slurping out of the cup. Now see this. Think of the Last Supper right now. Think of Holy Communion. Jesus with his disciples. The lamb is there. He's talking about his body, and he's the bread of life, and he's sharing this with them. The lamb is at the table with his disciples, and they're drinking out of the same cup. You see the parallels of what God's bringing together here, the connection of what he's bringing together. The family absolutely loved, loved this lamb. So it's not about us coming to church on a Sunday when we know that the lamb is here, and it's not like a petting zoo on Sundays when we just go like this, oh, just a nice lamb, just a nice lamb, and then Monday through Saturday we do whatever we want. It's not about that. The children grew up with the lamb inside of their home. They had a relationship with him. Everything happened inside the home. The lamb was there when the dad would teach the children about the law. The lamb was there when there was probably arguments or fights. The lamb was present in the house. This is the lamb needs to be present in our home. And it reminded me when the father, it says, brought the lamb to his bosom. God challenged me and said, Do you hear my heartbeat? Do you have my pulse? Are we that close? The father of the house brought the lamb and laid the lamb in the prison. And I believe that is something that God wants us to have in him. To put our ear right on our father's chest, our heavenly father's chest. To not only hear his heartbeat, to know what his heart is. Think of that. Now, as we're coming to an end, David, obviously, was told by Nathan that he was the man of the And when David was told that, he was a broken man, a repentant man. And David was forgiven eventually of everything. But I want to tell you, even though he did the things that he did, there was consequences for his decisions. When I worked in the prison system and I would talk to murderers and rapists and gangbangers and people who did terrible things with children and just all the things of, just the awful things of society and the people's lives, and you would see these prisoners after a point of coming to repentance and coming to their faith in Christ and to be forgiven of all their sins. And they would look at me and they would say, Chaplain, but why do I have to spend the rest of my life in jail? The answer is because of consequences. You are forgiven of your sins from God. But the law of the Lamb says you took your wife's life and you're going to be in prison the rest of your life. There is consequences for our disobedience. There is consequences for our sin. And it went on and on in David's family. You can read in the scriptures yourself. Because of David and Bathsheba, the baby boy died because of that sin. And then it went on to David's children. And it was horrific stuff because of consequences. Let's not think that we can get away with stuff. Let's not think that we're invisible. Let's not think that we're above other things or no one's going to find anything out. We serve a holy, righteous, just God. The Lamb. Let me just read this last verse. I love it out of King James, Exodus 12, 6. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall till it in the evening. The lamb would live in the house of the family for 14 days. In the Bible, the number 14, listen, biblically, 
Biblical mathematics tells us the number 14 has a double meaning. It refers to the numerical value of the name David in ancient Jewish numerology. It also references the number 7, which in ancient Jewish numerology is the number for spiritual perfection as 14th twice 7. It implies a double measure of that virtue. So, the question is, do you have the Lamb, meaning Jesus, in here? If you don't, you can this morning, let's pray. There's nothing more powerful than the blood of the Lamb. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As we bow before you, Lord, our holy Lord, our righteous Lord, our faithful Lord, I want to thank you that you came to this earth as a servant. You came and you fulfilled your assignment from God the Father to be that suffering servant as a sacrificial lamb for our sins in order for us to be reconciled to the Holy God because of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to be the one to fill the gap between sinful man and a holy God. We thank you for your sacrifice as the lamb and the blood that was shed is sufficient to take away all of our sins, our shame, our guilt, our failures, and take our sins, even though they're red as scarlet, and to make them as white as snow. with our heads bowed and we're all praying. And you would say, Pastor Terry, I get it. I get it this morning. As the scriptures were taught, that I don't have the Lamb, which is Jesus, in my heart as my personal Savior. And I need Him this morning so that I can go to heaven someday. How many would say, I got it? But I need the Lamb of God in my heart. Just raise your hand right now so I can see it. Don't be embarrassed. This is your time. I see your hand, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else? I need the Lamb. I need that Lamb who died for me to forgive me of all of my sins. And I realize this is about a relationship. This is not about a religion. I realize this is not about a denomination. This is about a relationship. This is your time. Don't let it pass by. Anyone else? Man, woman, or child? It says, I need the lamb. Come on, I see your hand. Anyone else? I see your hand in the back. Any others? There's three of you. Who else? Could you stand at your feet with me, please? like uh, Chuck and Dave, Pastor Jim, Pastor Shannon, and she's already up here playing. Uh, Linda, would you come please up here right now? If you get a chance, the next few Sundays, come earlier than 10 o'clock and join us in Linda's class on the Holy Spirit. Today her class is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This has nothing to do so directly with the Lamb as far as experience. What I'm talking about the Lamb is the salvation. I'm talking about having your name in the book of life. I'm talking about the most important experience that we could ever have. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is important too. It's a gift. We've been water baptized as a separate experience, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Holy Spirit. 
to empower us to witness, to empower to live holy lives, to have a strong prayer time together with the Lord. And so for Christians, if you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we want you to come so that you can have that, and we're going to pray for you for that. But for those three that raise their hands for salvation, I want you to come to me and let you can go to these uh, lady and gentlemen over here so they can lay hands on you and pray for the Holy Spirit. But for those of you that raise your hands and say, I want the Lamb of my life, I want you to come right now. Don't hesitate. Just come right now. Sarah, would you come? Sarah, do you want to come? That cross... I stood in Israel and looked at the area of the three crosses. This is what I thought about. I thought about the lamb. I thought about his blood that was shed coming out of his body. And I thought about this too and how they put my Savior on that cross. He was practically naked as in there. And I thanked him not only for the forgiveness of sins and my eternal life, but I thanked him that he publicly died on the cross for me and for him. And he wasn't ashamed. So 35, 40 years ago, I was asked to come forward, and my favorite seat was the back row. And I thought, I'm going to come forward and publicly say, I need the lamb. I need the lamb. And I didn't care what anybody thought of me. I didn't care what people were going to say about me. Because I needed the lamb. If he could die publicly in front of the world for me, I could surely take three or four steps publicly and say, I need the lamb. So would you gentlemen come on over here? I want you to pray with heaven and I'm at this time. I need this moment here. I'm going you right now, reach your hands out to you folks. We have one that has come publicly that wants to give her life to the Lamb, one who wants the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in her life. So let's enter into a season of prayer for these folks.
Father, we thank you this morning for Holy Spirit activity among us. We thank you that souls have been saved today. Your family just got a little bigger. People have been snatched from the grip of Satan today. He's upset and we don't care. But we do thank you. Thank you for being our lamb. Thank you for 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 being the great lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You took away some sin right now this morning in, in these couple of individuals, and we thank you <clears throat> for your grace, your mercy, your love, your, your presence always with us. Even as we leave today, we leave each other, but we don't leave you, and you don't leave us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.